everybody, everybody's got a cup of coffee and, uh, and uh, some cookies. There's pl plentiful supply of cookies I see back there. This podium is high, or I'm short. My, my legs were just barely long enough to reach the ground. So let's pray and get started tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together for your mercy that you've shown us that we might know you and have life from you. We thank you for that blessing and privilege. We pray tonight that as we attempt to study that you would, by your Holy Spirit, stir within us, give us insight, help us to understand that we may be fruitful in this awesome day. We thank you again for the blessing and privilege you've granted us in Messiah Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen. Tonight we're uh, looking at uh, post-biblical era. When Moses was born, Satan already had a plan for his destruction had it implemented in place, operating. Uh, and you know the account, how they, they managed to uh, get around that. Moses survived then in the house of Pharaoh uh, until he, the time of deliverance was near. Uh, I believe that whenever whenever God is about to do anything, whatever his activities are, that, that Satan has a dimension of foreknowledge also. I'm not sure how much, but some dimension of foreknowledge. And, uh, and, the, and the opposition to whatever the Lord is in the, in the process of doing, the opposition is already in place operating uh, to neutralize or counter whatever God's doing. Um, at the, at uh, uh, we we see uh, Herod attempting to uh, wipe out Jesus when he was born, or shortly thereafter. We, I'm not sure exactly the time frame. Perhaps there's a couple of years span there because he killed the children two years old. I guess that's what in New York today would be called a late-term abortion. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we joke at that, and it's, it's, it's not, it's uh, incredible. Anyway, but that's beside the point. Anyway, um, uh, I, I, I believe that that sort of thing operates so. And so uh, when, uh, when Jesus ministered and introduced the, the ministry of the kingdom of God and trained uh, disciples, 11 fruitful disciples and one not so fruitful, and that unfruitful one got replaced by uh, another one, Mr. Paul. Uh, then they went out preaching, teaching the precepts of the kingdom of God. People were filled with the Holy Spirit, and 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 th there was a rich ministry for uh, many, many years. I, and I'm not sure exactly how many, uh, but we can just uh, speculate that basically it held its own through the first century. So for maybe maybe uh, 60 to 70 years after Jesus' uh, death, resurrection, ascension, uh, I, I believe that the ministry uh, helped pretty nearly to the message of Jesus and, and the reality, uh, full reality of that. Uh, by the time of the second century, and there's many, many, many things going on, by the time the second century come along, uh, uh, the Roman Jewish war had been raging for 30 years. The temple, uh, or 30 plus years, I guess I should say, the, uh, the temple had been destroyed 30 in 70 AD. Uh, uh, and there was ongoing conflict between the Roman Empire and Jewish, Jewish folks, wherever they were, particularly in the land, but wherever they were. There, there were uh, riots and whatever in various cities. And, and that war broke out in, in heated battle again in 132 AD. 
with the uh, Bar Kokhba revolt, which lasted about three years, and then and then uh, it was it was a it ended up being a very very tough time to be Jewish in the Roman Empire, really really tough time, and so and so there had be after the destruction of Jerusalem, there had been somewhat of a breach between uh, Jewish people from Jewish backgrounds that were believers in Jesus at that time and the, uh, the other sects of Judaism. And so there was animosity between them and it grew in more intense with time. Uh, Christians were considered as traitors in the cause against Rome uh, because, uh, because, you know, J Jesus said when you see these things happening, flee and whatever from the city and so on. And, and so uh, many of them took that when the Romans surrounded Jerusalem. And so they were considered as traitors, and so the, there was real animosity between the, uh, what we would say today, the Orthodox uh, Juda Judaism and the, these Messianic Jews, Christians. Uh, the church would have been predominantly, predominantly uh, led with, with people from Jewish backgrounds. So the idea of identity with Israel, something that we battled with and struggled over the years with, uh, was just second nature to them. They, they, there was, I don't. There was never a question in mind of that they were identifying with Israel. Paul talks in Ephesians two, uh, what eleven and twelve, uh, that that now you're, he's talking to we who are from Gentile backgrounds, saying you were formerly you know separate from the uh, commonwealth of Israel, but now in Jesus you've been made a part of it. So so it's clear that their mentality. They were purely, totally identified with, with Israel. Uh, Romans 11, he says, uh, you know, that you're grafted into the rich olive tree and so on and so forth. So, so I, I think that mentality was clear. Uh, but uh, by the turn of the century, uh, the Jewish leadership was, uh, the apostles were all dead. Uh, uh, in, influx of leadership from Gentile backgrounds had, had uh, that was commonplace, and uh, people people then had did not have a, a, a natural uh, inclination to be associated with Israel. And remember, it's there's ongoing warfare against them, and so and so uh, uh, it was a it, it took extraordinary commitment and effort to maintain identity with Israel. And these folks didn't have any obvious reason why they should do so, every reason not to do so, and so, and the animosity between, so the divide just went more and more, uh, grew. And here's where I think, uh, here's where I think the enemy was prepared to jump on it. It is in this setting that the Gnostics uh, philosophers uh, started having their greatest influence uh, uh, in the Christian community. Some around uh, 110, 120 A.D., somewhere in that range, we see uh, literature of some of the, of the Gnostics. And, uh, and they, they almost totally prevailed, uh, and their influence was great, uh, even though the church leaders that did survive, uh, each, every one, or most all of them, uh, warred against them. If you read the church fathers in that era, the, uh, the, all of them have uh, 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 papers written uh, against heresies or whatever, and they're, and they're writing ag against the movement of Gnosticism. Uh, but, but the Gnostics had great appeal, and uh, and uh, a, a tremendous effect. I, I'm going to I'm going to make the argument tonight that now uh, traditional Christianity, uh, we would call it uh, Constantinian Christianity or or uh, traditional. I, you, you can tag it any way you like. What uh, whatever traditional Christianity, uh, and I mean by that you know the local Baptist church, the local Catholic church, the local Methodist or whatever. Uh, I always say that the Baptist Church is uh, is uh, is really Catholic. It really is Catholic, you know. 
because it, because it assumes a non-national identity separate from Israel. And so that's what Catholic means. And, and so, the, the, so the influence of, the, even though there was a battle between what we would ca consider Orthodox Christianity, what would become Orthodox Christianity, and the Gnostics, and supposedly the Gnostics uh, lost in that struggle. And, and nevertheless, they, the result of that was tremendous influence on the evolution of what we know as Orthodox Christianity. The ideas of Orthodox Christianity was shaped greatly by the Gnostics. And so we'll get into the details of that and try to understand uh, how that took place. Um, uh, one other factor that was important in this era. Uh, during the first century, uh, especially up until 70 AD, the, the church in Jerusalem was, was, the, was the, like, mother church, we might say. The dominant, the dominant had a dominant authority. And so we see in Acts 15, whatever the date is, I'm not sure what that is, probably around 50 AD or something like that. But we see there arose a question about what, how to deal with uh, uh, people from Gentile backgrounds that were becoming believers. And so the thing was appealed to Jerusalem. A council of the elders met in Jerusalem and made a decision, sent messengers out to the various churches. So there was a central authority uh, in the church um, uh, up, until, up until, we'll say, at least 70 A.D. Uh, now, after Jerusalem was destroyed, overrun by the Romans, the temples destroyed, people were scattered all over. If, they weren't, if, he, if he didn't scatter, you got nailed to a cross. And so, and so you scattered if you could. So, uh, again, very difficult time. From that point until 325 A.D., There was, there was essentially no central authority in the Christian movement. Uh, 325 is the date of the first general council of the church uh, held at Nicaea. Uh, Emperor Constantine convened it and utilized it, uh, whatever. And, and so from, from that point forward, there were church councils and the church councils uh, ex exerted central authority in the evolution of Christianity. Of course, there were sects splitting off in every way, but nevertheless, there was a, there was, and, and in that era, if you, if you mess with the central authority, you, you might just get uh, uh, burned at the stake or something. I mean, it was pretty severe. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day, we were talking about fellowship. We, at one point, got the left foot of fellowship from a local Baptist uh, uh, community. Uh, uh, but in those days, when you got the left foot of fellowship, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was very disagreeable. Uh, it wasn't very nice. They probably just killed you. Burned you at the stake. Something nice like that. And there's, and there's plenty of folks that endured that sort of thing. So anyway, so no central authority, and that, that, gave, that gave place for, for this thing to, uh, for each area, uh, each central area, uh, uh, kind of a nucleus of uh, where uh, Christianity was developing and nucleating from, uh, to develop relatively independent one another. So there were, uh, we might cite centers at Alexandria in Egypt, Jerusalem, of course, uh, Antioch in Syria, uh, Ephesus in what's now Turkey, Asia Minor, uh, uh, Rome, uh, what's the one in North Africa I always have trouble remembering? Uh, uh, pardon? No, it's, it's Egypt, that's North Africa, of course. Uh, no, I'm talking about, you know, Carthage, Carthage, thank you. I could, I always, somehow, Carthage never comes up. So Car Carthage was an important uh, center. 
So, so these areas, you can imagine communications was not that great. They didn't have the internet, uh, didn't have Fox News or anything, see? So they were greatly limited, and therefore uh, the, the interaction was limited. And so each area grew to, to a reasonable degree independent of one another, no central authority. Uh, and, and, and so, and so uh, di different groups, different areas would, would, uh, would uh, develop. Uh, they, the first general council in 325 was, was convened because of the d teaching of a man named Arius. Anybody ever hear of him? Arius? Somebody help me if I'm wrong there, you might correct me. I'm just going off the top of my head here, so I'm prone to error. Arius. Arius believed that Jesus uh, was uh, born as any of us with the same fallen nature, if you might say, as any of us. He was, he was only by perfection, by obedience. Uh, not, in other words, he denied the virgin birth of conception, I said. Uh, the, the birth of Jesus was natural. The conception was supernatural. And so, and so he denied that. So, so, uh, uh, so there, was a, there was a stir in Christianity. It was being divided between those that agreed with him and those that didn't. And, and as a result, uh, Christianity was being divided. Um, Constantine, who, uh, who was, uh, uh, had struggled to unify uh, uh, the, Rome, the Roman Empire of his day, uh, uh, saw in Christianity the prospect of a solid uh, grassroots backbone to the empire to hold it together. Uh, sort of a, a, a blue a blue collar uh, nuts and bolt uh, backbone for the empire, and so he adopted Christianity in that in that way. And uh, so the division in Christianity posed a great threat to his effort at empire, and so he convened the first general council, and uh, and uh, they outlawed uh, 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 Arius and his teaching. And so if you were caught teaching uh, Arius' views, uh, the Romans would just uh, have your head. Or maybe they would let you fight the lions or whatever they like to do with you in those days. So there was no ACLU, no, uh, uh, what, what's the international group? Uh, I've forgotten their name. Pardon? No, the, there's a, Human Rights International Group, I don't remember what their name is. So, so, uh, uh, so he, uh, Constantine was responsible for a certain authority. By this time, the uh, Gnostic struggle was, was pretty well in, in, under control, but again, Gnosticism, the concepts of Gnosticism crept into Orthodox Christianity, and, and I'm hopeful of being able to convey that uh, roughly well. So I want to look, first of all, at, by the way, in questions or comments, please, please, uh, toss them out uh, so that we can talk about them. Uh, is this going to work tonight? Oh, I didn't turn it on. Eh, that will help. I didn't even put my chip in. You got to do all kinds of stuff for these guys, I tell you. Bill, Bill Gates should have known that already. Is this, ain't, this has one battery. I guess that's all it has. All right. Now, now I'll turn it on. And I'll test it. Oh, I must have something going here. Let's try again. Nope, not going to work, huh? Come on, buddy. We'll figure it out one of these days. Well, come on, buddy.
Okay, so, and so the, the response to that was uh, the foundation for, for the uh, Nicene, Nicene Creed where Jesus was declared to be of consubstantial, of exactly the same substance as the Father, one and the same, uh, whatever the wording of the Nicene Creed is. And then there was a subsequent council in, I believe it was 381, it's, I've forgotten where, that declared that the Holy Spirit uh, was consubstantial of exactly the same essence and substance as the Father. So, so therefore, the definition for the mystical Holy Trinity was defined in those two councils uh, against uh, Arianism as such. Uh, the, the, the first general council at Nicaea, they, they went through all of this about the, the exact nature of the Father and the Son being exactly the same. And, and uh, uh, the, I know there had to be a committee that dealt with this because at the end of it, and I've forgotten the wording, but something about the Holy Spirit. They include the Holy Spirit. So, so it, I, knew, I knew from being in various meetings that they were almost ready to go to lunch and somebody said, but what about the Holy Spirit? <laughs> and so they, they tagged it on. But at a subsequent council, they dealt with it. So, so, so that, that was... So, so, so uh, now, now you, can, you, can look at the, you can look at their, their discussion there and their decisions, and some of you would agree with some of it, and some others would agree with different of it, and all of that uh, is academic in a sense, because it is all post-biblical. It's all post-biblical. And so when we, when we come to the point of saying that the Bible is the basis of our, the foundation for our faith, then that's where we have to stand. And what the, what the Bible doesn't define, we don't have the liberty to do so. And so there, 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 are, there is more about the relationship of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There's more that we don't know than what we do know. I'm, I'm satisfied at that. And, and so there, we reach a point that we, uh, we, we live by faith. Uh, somehow, somewhere down the line, Jesus has intervened in your life. And every one of us are different, but somewhere he intervened somehow and, and got your attention and turned you around and somehow you became a, a believer and responded to him and you received somehow the Holy Spirit that guides you into... And so, so we know something about the Father, the Holy One of Israel. We know something about Jesus the Messiah, our Lord, We've received the Holy Spirit. We experience the Holy Spirit, although it's kind of hard to define exactly who and what and where. And, and that's, that's where we stand. If I go any further than that, I'm going to conflict with everyone in the room because your experience is going to be different than mine. And so, and so further definition of doctrine becomes divisive rather than unifying. And, and we are committed to be unified because as we're unified, Jesus can be Lord in our midst. And so, so that, that becomes a, a little tedious, but something very important for us to deal with. And so Christianity as, as a whole has made the foundational concept the, the so-called mystical Holy Trinity, actually defined by... Uh, Augustine uh, in the fifth century. I mean, really detailed it, uh, and 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 by such initiated the largest cult in history. Traditional Christianity. Yes, sir. My wife said that I want to be careful not to say anything controversial tonight. So, so it's been it's being recorded. <laughs> It's being recorded, so <laughs> I'm sorry, you had a question or a comment. I did write that. <laughs> we 
Well, I think I said that. I said I think I said that Augustine is the one that that put, uh, laced it all together. There were su- there were preceding councils that established the real foundation. I think it. I think it is Augustine that really laced it together and made it made it acceptable. And, and yeah. No. I'll give you an example. In your, in your book, you talk about, and this is like Mormonism, one of the uh, people, and I don't remember who it was, I just remember this because it's so profound, that they believed that um, God was a man before he was God. Do you remember that? That's in the book. No, I don't remember. I didn't write that. That's not in the book. But it's not in my book. It's some, somebody's it's book, maybe. It's in your book, but you took it from another book, I'm sure. Well, I might have been saying somebody felt that way. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember that. I haven't read that. It's a good book, too. I recommend it highly. <laughs> I, 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 I to, I to, Jerry's not so convinced. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, I'm going to have to sit down and read it. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow. If my side don't come in, I'll do it tomorrow. Everything that they put in the pot, you know, that was part of the pot. I know because everything yeah. still came off. Yeah. He was the deciding factor of everything they put in the pot. Well, yeah, maybe we could kind of call, kind of call him an editor. Okay. Uh, that pull, pull it, pull it, he pulled it, pulled it together and popularized it, and um, and uh, and and hence become the dominant church father. I have read that uh, Luther, Martin Luther, uh, his real quest uh, uh, was to was to uh, bring Christianity back to the 5th century of uh, Augustine. That's, that's what he really was aiming to do. Uh, he, he's, he, sparked, he sparked some things that got loose from him and went from there. So, okay, so now we want to look at, I don't know if this is going to work for me today, so don't I'll walk over there, it's all right. I need the exercise. Uh, uh, some of the real, real fundamental concepts common to Gnosticism is that they differentiate between the God that's revealed in the New Testament from the God that's revealed in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, we would maintain that there is a, there is a, a, a continuity from Genesis to Revelation, absolute, powerful continuity uh, from uh, uh, obviously the work of one intellect of revel- revelation wise coming forth uh, the picture of redemption that's pictured in the whole whole uh, uh, of the Bible uh, these guys did not see that they the Gnostics felt that the God of they differ somewhat but the God of the of, of Israel the, the, the God of the Hebrews uh, was a bit of a tyrant and uh, evil, and uh, and the God of the New Testament revealed by Jesus was uh, full of grace and mercy and love, and they def- they differentiated that way. Oops, it did work. Look at that. Okay, uh, they believe that God is. They believe that the ultimate source, the ultimate creator, the ultimate of God, was unknowable but has emanations from his, from his being, uh, which are spiritual beings that operate somewhere in the, in the various levels of heaven between man and God. That's obscure enough. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me go on. Look at that. <laughs> I can do it behind my back, too. You ready? See that? Okay. They believe that the material universe was evil. And that the evil that is manifested in the world is a result of the faulty design or creation of the world, not the result of individual sin or the, or the corporate 
an impact of, of individual sin. In other words, my sin is not really the problem. The problem is the situation I found myself in. Sounds sort of like some of the folks out here in, 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 the, in the country today. Uh, what was it on, is in West Side Story? Remember West Side Story? Everybody, somebody remembers West Side Story? I am, I am depraved because I was deprived. That was a story, that was a statement, as I recall, in West Side Story. Somebody would make that declaration. Well, the body is part of the material world. Part, part of it. Okay, uh, let's see what else we can find out. Uh, they believe that Jesus was not born of the flesh physically. In other words, Jesus didn't have a physical body as such, but rather a docetic manifestation. Just, in other words, a spirit being and just appeared to be in bodily form. So they denied that you know, you know, some of the New Testament, John in particular, talks about, you know, uh, you have to, you believe that Jesus was born of the flesh, whatever. I forgot how he said it, but anyway, he obviously was, he obviously, there must have been some Gnostic stuff going on in his days, and it sounds to me like he was attempting to respond to it to some degree. Okay? All right, do I have anything else there? They believe that there was a divine spark within each of us. Uh, in other words, derived from... Uh, now, you have the unknowable, exalted God, emanations from him, which has a dimension of divinity, and then they, because they were participant in the actual creating event of the material world of which we are a part, then there is a divine spark in each of us. And, and that divine spark with proper Gnostic, proper knowledge, secret knowledge, uh, uh, could, could allow the soul, or the essence of the person, maybe I shouldn't say the soul, it may, may assume it too much, uh, essence of the person to to reach <laughs> did I spell that wrong? That's not that's not spelled right. Floroma, P H, isn't it? I think I spelled the word wrong. I'll see if I can find it. No, that's right. P L E R O M A. Me, meaning uh, a state of form. In other words, if you put in New Age stuff, it's an it's a ultimate uh, of, of, uh, of spiritual consciousness to the highest level. Highest level of spiritual consciousness. You hear that kind of terminology in New Age stuff, don't you? Reaching a higher level of spiritual consciousness. So, so, so uh, it, with proper knowledge and exercise of that knowledge, then you could, the essence of a, a person could, that divine essence in them could escape this evil, crusted world and arrive at pleroma, or fullness. Okay? Any questions about that? I'm sorry? All of it, but by, by around that time, would, would, when the New Testament itself would have been, would have been uh, canonized. I'm not sure of the exact date, but but it would have been in that era. It, up up into that time, for a long time, they just took like the letters of Paul and and uh, sent them around to different. One church would send it to another, and that sort of thing. And so eventually, then a group of church leaders, elders, and I'm not even sure how and when that took place. Uh, Haley's handbook, I think, a uh, Bible handbook, has a description of that process, and I read it about 100 years ago, <laughs> but I don't remember, don't remember the Anyway, somewhere around 300 A.D., that, that was pulled together, 
and made into a, a document that stand, stand alone. Uh, yeah, there's all kinds of uh, books that were, were not incorporated uh, into the so-called New Testament. Uh, the, uh, the book of Hebrews was probably the, I think he considered the last uh, book that was actually, mm, we don't, and so they, they incorporated. I, I, I believe that's correct. Okay, the, uh, the, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, of course, uh, had existed for thousands of years at that point. Well, I shouldn't say a thousand years. Uh, um, uh, probably by the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, most of what we have as the Old Testament was, was accepted. Uh, and then you have a, f a few books following that, like uh, what, Malachi and Zeph uh, Zephaniah, Mal not Zephaniah, probably, Malachi and uh, Zechariah. Zechariah and Malachi would probably be the last uh, from a chronological standpoint. And, and so uh, it, it's my theory that something has to go, you have to have something about three or 400 years old before uh, people forget that some human actually had a part in it. Uh, or has that person has become, they forgot all of his dirty little secrets, and, and so therefore uh, that he has become, got to the point that people elevate him to be able to receive it. Uh, for, for example, uh, uh, in our culture, uh, now this, in, in our company here, uh, if you go to the university campus, it wouldn't be true. By George Washington, probably a pretty well uh, all-around great guy. Because we don't really know what George Washington did when he was a teenager that much. You know. I don't know if he drove his car to school, if he chewed back her in class. I don't know what he did. Nobody ever talked about that. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's Gnostics today. I don't know. I, I, the answer to your question is no, but I know they're there. Uh, but I don't know specifically of groups. I don't know. Pastor Diaz might know of some. I don't. Yeah, uh, uh, act, active Gnostics today. I'm sure there are. I just don't know of a... Jerry, you might know too. I, well, uh, yeah, Orthodox Christianity is basically Gnostic. Uh, yeah. So, so, so I'm sure they are. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not very aware of them. But, uh, all right. Uh, okay, Any, anything else we need? The, these are, this is not, and not all Gnostics embraced every aspect of this, but this is just a general uh, treatment of, uh, so, so, so they, now one of the aspects of Christianity is the separation between uh, Christianity and Israel. Now, if you think that the world is evil and that the God of the Jews created the world and that the God revealed in Jesus uh, is the good one, different from the God of the Jews. Can you see how that might tend to push the separation? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Any other comments or questions about this? If you got a question I can't answer, I'll just refer you. We'll go ahead. All right. So let's go back and just look at that, look at it quickly. Uh, Differentiate between the God revealed in the New Testament and the God revealed in the Old Testament. Believe that God basically, whoever and whatever he is, is some sort of perfect, awesome, unknowable, transcendent. All of creation came out of him in some way. Uh, and that emanations came out from him and and the lowest level of those emanations are responsible for the creation of the material world uh, and man. All right? Uh, material universe is evil, and, 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 and so one of the questions, there, there's not necessarily a great uh, 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 pressure for morality uh, here because 
because you know anything material is evil, so it's just the way it is. So you can you can I mean uh, some some agnostics would make good TV preachers today. <laughs> they believed in messing around with the messing around with the ladies is okay, whatever. All right, Jesus was not born of the flesh. Because you see, if, if the world and man, man of, of the earth is evil, then this, this divine being from, from this unknowable God could not possibly have been born uh, uh, into the world because that would, that would tag him with, with being evil himself. So they had to imagine that he was uh, just the uh, spiritual manifestation. Uh, posing, uh, having the appearance of a man. Uh, some of them even believe that, uh, maintain that uh, uh, Jesus uh, never died on the cross uh, and that at the last minute uh, he, he kind of trade places, uh, he had the spiritual power to trade places with some dude and that dude got crucified in his place. So, uh, so all right. Uh, that divine spark in man, uh, and that, that divine spark gives open the possibility through Gnostic knowledge, special secret knowledge, to, to and death, to when we release from this physical world body, uh, to ascend to fullness or paloma. All right. Okay. Uh, how are we doing? Oh, we got, we're doing great. Yes, sir. No, it, it, that is a common concept in Gnosticism. Not all, uh, not all would define it in exactly the same way. Well, the there are different you, schools of Gnosticism. Well, I didn't capitalize God. Why? Because I'm repeating Gnostic stuff. Okay. 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 And so from their standpoint, no, that, that was my de designation. I thought about that and I said, I'm not going to put a capital G up there representing what Gnostics believe because they, they, don't, they, don't they don't embrace my concept of the Holy One of Israel. So, but, but that's not their doctrine. That's, that was my choice in this particular slide. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up if that was a question because I did that. Okay, uh, now I'm going to look at, we're going to look, it's all of this, I think most all of this is in your book, one place or the other. Uh, oh, uh, Mr. Helene and I were talking about this the other day, uh, and he brought this question, and I thought that was, it was good. Maybe I can stop before we get into Basilians and uh, ask this question. Anybody ever hear the uh, expression, that a person had come or needed to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. You've heard that expression? Uh, what does that mean? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, I'm not. I'm not talking. I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about. Uh, fact, uh, accepting facts, I'm saying the concept of coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus. Uh, and and that, reflects, that reflects the concepts of Gnosticism a little bit. Yes, Laura. Okay, so that, would that be saving knowledge or maybe a saving experience? I would say it's both. Okay. All right, that's 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 okay. But but according to Nas, okay, I think according, uh, what what I'm trying to get at with the question is that is that uh, when, when we I grew up knowing about Jesus. I grew up in the little Baptist churches. Uh, uh, 
uh, went to Sunday school uh, up until I didn't have to anymore before I quit. Um, I knew about Je I knew all kinds of facts about Jesus. Uh, when I was about 30, I met him. Oh boy. When, when, I was, when I was about 30, I came to a point of crisis in my life. And as, as a result of that crisis, uh, uh, I, I, I knew no other name to call other than Jesus. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't thinking theologically or anything. I mean, you know, I was in trouble and I was crying out for help. And that's the only name that I knew to call on. Oh yeah, I grew up in I grew up I grew up in the church, and and mom and dad were believers and and you know whatever, uh, so yeah I had I had I, I had that I was blessed to have that foundation, so I knew so so when I called I called on a reputable vendor, <laughs> so so uh, so it, but it was at that point that I met him and that actually took place over a two year period but but and uh, but I met him and and experienced him to the point that I became a believer but that again that happened over a couple of years actually in my life as that was taking place uh other than uh, other than, other than other than I'd run, I'd run my car into the ditch, <laughs> and I, I run my car in the ditch, and I couldn't get out, and so I did something. I know what you mean, and it, you're right, of course. But, but, uh, uh, so, so now the Bible says that I didn't choose Jesus. The Bible says that He chose me, uh, which is which a bit is kind of baffling in itself. Uh, but whatever, whatever, it's what it says. And so, uh, did I pursue Jesus or did Jesus pursue me? And that's a question that all of us can play with, but, and I don't think you're going to come up with a real answer. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you may come to an answer that you're confident within yourself, but you're not going to be able to establish some sort of doctrinal uh, thing that's good for everybody there. So, so, um, so that... that so I, I think we're talking more about more than just, uh, you know, dealing with knowledge. We're, as Laura said, I think we're talking about knowledge and experience, both looped together, that brings, a, brings us to a position of belief uh, to the degree of obedience. Uh, and so, so I think most of us have come to a dimension of belief that leads to obedience. And, and now... We haven't we haven't passed the final exam yet. So if if Jesus comes in the morning, uh, you know, you know half of us half of us might make the cut and the other half not. We you know it remains to be seen, doesn't it? That my faith is I'll make the cut. So, uh, but but that's a faith thing within me. I don't have a signed document that says for sure that's who it's going to be. So, okay. Uh, all right. I don't know how we got into that. Yes, sir, Dale. Uh, just one uh, point there is he said, he that comes to me will not be. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. So, well, Jesus said, he that comes to me, I will in no way. Yes. So, that yeah. Is yeah. Is yeah. That. Yeah, sure. Sure. So, so there's all kinds of biblical foundation for our position, and so we rejoice. I, I'm praise God. You know, you know, one of, one of the you know one of the issues you, you need to you, maybe you don't need to think about it, but it's interesting to think about. Um, Israel met God at Mount Sinai, and and there was an awesome manifestation. And what was Israel's response to that? 
they, they were scared to death. They were scared to death. Now, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, there was an awesome manifestation of God in, uh, in Jerusalem, and there was 120 believers in the upper room, and what was their response to that awesome manifestation? They received it, were filled with the Holy Spirit, and spoke in other tongues, and, and they were powerful. What was the difference? Now, in, in, in both cases, we're talking about, ethnically, we're talking about Jewish people. No Gentiles involved in either case. Well, I'm, well, take that with a grain of salt. I'm, there may have been some Goyim mixed in, I don't know. But basically, that's what we're talking about. What, what was the difference, would you think about? Well, yeah, but, but they were expecting something, but think about it. they had 1,500 years or better, 2,000 years of written foundation that they could go back and, and Samuel, God spoke to Samuel this way, God spoke to David this way, and, and how did it end up for David? Did it, was that good or bad? Well, he became the greatest king of Israel. Uh, God spoke to Jeremiah. John, you know, uh, so they had, they had a, uh, the same history that we have now dealing with. Uh, a record of interaction between man and God that the Israelis coming out of Egypt did not have. They had some... They had some account of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the sons of Israel going into Egypt. They had some sort of account of that, but they didn't have much of a record of revelation. The people in the upper room on the day of Pentecost had a, had a bold, you, got, you carry it around with you, it's called your Bible. They had a bold written account that they were familiar with, they had been schooled in, of record of interaction between, and they weren't necessarily afraid. And they warmly and openly received the Holy Spirit. And so when the Holy Spirit came to you, you weren't afraid either. Because you had this even more testimony, which is wonderful. Yes, ma'am. Wait here. Yeah, wait here until you receive endowment from power from on high. Yes, so so they were they were, but they weren't they they weren't saying, mm, God, I wonder what this is. And then there was a there was a mighty rushing wind. Every, everything was being knocked around, and and it, it was enough to alarm you. But they weren't alarmed. They were prepared, and they received it. Jerry. Yeah. Well, well, that's true. But my point is, though, that that the people at Sinai had had a very minimal foundation on which to. Now they they had experienced an awesome. Listen, they they had followed the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And the mountain was shaken, but but they they thought they were they thought they were fixing to die right away, even though they had come through the sea and followed the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, whatever, and come to Sinai, that they thought they were dying. We're dead men. They said to Moses, hey, "You go talk to them, and let us know what he says." But. Let us not, because if we do, we're going to, they weren't going to die, God wasn't going to kill them, but they thought he was. So I'm just making the point, and we have that wonderful record also uh, in our experience. Okay, let's, let's talk about the Cilians, one of the earliest uh, Gnostics. We're talking around 120, 125 AD, something like that. Uh, so we're talking about 100 years after uh, after the ministry of Jesus, or maybe a little under. 
Uh, so not, not, not that far. Not that far. If I back up 100 years, I get to the end of uh, World War I. Anybody here fought in World War I? <laughs> Nobody here. <laughs> I missed the cut there too. But I was alive during World War II. Now, I wasn't a big guy, but I was, I was kicking around. All right, so Basiliad, I however you like to pronounce his name. Basiliads, I guess. Uh, he saw that the ultimate source was the unknowable, unborn father, everything emanating from him. This is the ultimate uh, God uh, and the un, and the un, uh, unborn father uh, begot a son, Naos. What does Naos mean in Greek? Temple, temple. Naos. That's what was that? Oh, I thought it stepped on the pup. <laughs> So, so uh, Naos' firstborn son ultimately manifested as Jesus uh, and conveyed gnosis or special knowledge to select disciples. Naos begot Logos. Logos is Greek for word. But he was born to Naos, and I don't know a lot of detail about what these different guys did. Uh, to Logos was born uh, Phronesis, 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 is that close? Phronesis, which is wise thought. To Phronesis was born Sophia, wisdom, and Dynamis. Okay, now. To these la now these are emanations from this unknowable God, and uh, and Sophia and Dynamis are near the bottom of the stack here, and so from them comes powers, principalities, and angels, and and these uh, these powers, principalities, and angels uh, created lower heavens, 365 of them. I guess one for each day. See, if they lived on Saturn, it would have been different. <laughs> but 365 of them. And the, the angels of the lowest heavens, the very, so you have 365, you get down to 364, and then 365, the lowest heaven, then the, the principalities and angels that made that one, created that one, Created the material universe and including man. Okay? I remember the story from Paul. I forgot where he went. They were in the Greek and he preached them in Bethlehem. Yeah, I remember that, right? Athens, well, no, no. Uh, the, 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 the philosophers at Athens had erected a monument to the unknown God. They had monuments to a whole, whole host of gods, and, and so they, in, in order to make sure they didn't leave anybody out, they named, they put a monument up to the unknown God. So, so Paul is speaking to him. He said, the one that you call unknown, I'll declare to you. He's the God of Jew, the Jewish people, God of Israel. So, so Paul, Paul just used that as a, as a opportunity, teachable moment. Yeah, an opportunity to. Weren't they still into the philosophy, the Greek philosophy, and that was entailed with the unknown God? Well, I suppose uh, I, you know that's what they were. They were they specialized in philosophy, yeah, I know. And, and so and so and so that was one of the results of their philosophical meditations, I'm sure. Somebody said, hey, we may have left a God out. And so we have to do something about that. So let's just make ourselves a nice monument out here and dedicate to the unknown God. It's kind of like, uh, you know, at, at, uh, at uh, what's the National Cemetery in D.C.? 
Arlington, and like a, we have a tomb for an unknown soldier. So if somebody's buried there, we don't know who it is. But we, we, we honor all unknown, all the men and women that have perished and there's no record of are honored through that one. And so I suppose the mentality of the Greeks were something like that. Paul, Paul wasn't declaring that what they thought was unknown. Uh, he was just using that as an opportunity uh, to, to, to preach, which he did. All right. Uh, by the way, that lowest one that created a material world was none other than the God of Israel the God of the Jewish people, the God of the Old Testament. And he's the one that ended up creating the world and man. This is just another, another pattern of the, the pantheon of God. Yeah, yeah, just same thing. Yeah, so, so they're, they're able to loop in all kinds of Greek stuff, uh, 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 all kinds of, uh, pluralistic gods uh, incorporated within the concept. But, but the lowest order that ended up doing, creating man, uh, the world, material world and mankind was the, the God of the Jewish people. Uh, actually, there are different angels in there and they divided up different portions of different peoples and, and, and the, God of the, of the, the God of the Jews uh, the angel or the God that, of the Jews uh, wanted the Jews to dominate everybody else and so uh, that caused rivalry between the various angels and that's why the Jewish people have so much difficulty interacting with other peoples because of the, the cause, cause the God of the Jews were the worst because he was wanting to dominate everybody. Dale. So when did the sea break and the sea like uh, where did we get any of this? Where did we name all of uh, I, I think that's a safe statement. <laughs> 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 these guys these guys were now one of the things that you 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 begin to see uh, if you read the church fathers, all of them. Uh, oh, not all necessarily, but I, I would say the mo the majority. The, the, first of all, first of all, they were incredibly diligent. They wrote in just tremendous. They were work oriented. They they weren't slouchers. They were bright. They weren't slouchers. And and I think I, I think it's safe to say, or this is my conclusion. It may, may not be. It wouldn't be considered a scholarly conclusion. But they were as impressed with Greek scholarship as they were with biblical revelation, and and so and so that that you you, you remember I said to me go as as soon as God does something the enemy is already prepared to to and and Greek scholarship and language I I think is is one of the great uh, demons sitting there ready to gobble up the message of Jesus. This, now, a lot of people, a lot of scholars today, Christian scholars, I would say, will say that uh, uh, the, the, the Greek language, which was the international language of that day, the Greek language was a, was a great asset to the message of Jesus because, because it facilitated preaching the message all over the known world of that day. Uh, I, I see it just the opposite. Uh, I, as a result of that, the, all kinds of Greek pagan influences were in, infiltrating uh, the message of Jesus, t taking it way off track from where it was, where it was supposed to be. So I think it's a trap that Satan set to devour the message, not promote it. So let's see what else we can say about the Ciliads. Oops, that's all we can say about them. Uh, oh, by the way, 
I don't loan books. I give you a reference. Now, if you need something to put you to sleep, if you have trouble going to sleep at night, don't watch the late news. Buy this thing and just read it. It's almost as good as the Quran. <laughs> It'll put you to sleep. <laughs> but it, uh, it does have a treat. It does, it, he's talking about, he's, a, he's an authority on Gnosticism. He, he, he treats, treats all of these guys and what they believe. And, and I'm, just, I'm just skimming over their belief. Now, please understand, I'm not, a, I'm not some sort of scholar on these guys. Uh, uh, I've I studied the last couple of days trying to get ahead of you. <laughs> so, so, so uh, but the point of what I want to convey tonight is that these guys managed to divert the message of Christianity from what Jesus and Paul and Peter and these guys preached, they managed to divert it into a totally different focus and message and, and which holds and remains to this very day. And so we're in the process of trying to back up and recapture the essence of what Jesus was really talking about. Because because the church, uh, Constantine or Augustine or Luther or Billy Graham, for that matter, doesn't mean squat to me. Jesus does. Jesus' message is what I'm interested in. I don't mean to try to belittle any of those people and whatever they accomplished or did, but, 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 when, I, when my car was in the ditch, it was Jesus that pulled me out. Nobody else did. And so, and so I'm, I'm, interested, I'm interested in his message. And so, and so, and so, and you, you know, when I became, uh, I've talked about this before, when Joe and, Joe and I were living in Maryland, and, and we became believers there, really. That was at the end of that two-year period that I'm talking about. And so, and so we ended up coming, I came down here to, to get involved in a seminary. And, and so we, we lived in St. Petersburg, and I worked at Florida Power, and, uh, and uh, we went to meetings every night, almost. I mean, there's a full gospel business and then meeting over here and the Pentecostal church over here and the little church that we went to. We went to the Baptist church for a while, but we went to, ended up going to, they were too busy for us. And, and so we went to a little Pentecostal church. And, and so, and it ended up being a good experience for us. And so wh- whatever the case was. And uh, I became an elder in that Pentecostal church. You didn't know I was an elder in the Pentecostal church. Look at that. Pentecost, Holy Ghost. Hey, that's me. So anyway, anyway, uh, we were going to meetings every night, and I was studying, and and had uh, in that you know first year or two a real, real intense communion experience with Jesus, just intense every day. I, and I wish I had that intensity today. I don't. I, I I I guess he figures I don't need it. I don't know. Maybe I don't deserve it. <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? Anyway, whatever, whatever the case, in going to meetings all the time and, and this intense devotion and study, uh, there was a discontinuity between what... And I was hearing some world-class teachers and preachers, and then on the other hand, something was, something was out of touch. And, and I realized eventually that my head and my heart was in different, operating in different realms. My heart was in Jesus and in the scriptures, and my head was being dealing with what these guys were saying. And eventually, and it took a long time, but eventually I realized that the message that these are, uh, excellent teachers, knock your socks off type teachers, great. I'm talking about Bob Mumford type people. Derek Prince, people like that. Uh, the message that these guys were preaching, 
was different than what Jesus was talking about. And I said, that can't be true. Not Bob Mumford. And he was good, and he is good. And I, he's alive, he's still good, I expect. If he came here tonight and we all sat down and listened to him, uh, uh, the revelation that he would bring to us would knock our socks off. I'm, uh, uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, Mr. Klein said, uh, Bob Murphy's going to be at a group downtown. You want to go? Yeah, we'll go. I was, I was thinking to myself, well, you know, I've kind of passed him up by this time, you know. He's kind of old school. And so uh, I went down and listened to him, and he knocked my socks off. I mean, he was, he was good. Just, I mean, you, you just a revelation that just caused bumps to run up and down your arm. That type, of, that type of good I'm talking about, see. So, but their message differed from Jesus. And eventually I had to deal with that. And that, that's what brought us to this point. Well, let's get, a, let's get a cookie and take a little break. Uh, way, you mean way back? Father?
All right, we're going to go quickly now because we're going to run out of time. Uh, but you, you already have the idea. Uh, Marcion, again, how, how these names are pronounced, uh, pr probably I'm, I'm slaughtering them pretty badly. Uh, uh, s some people don't look at Marcion as a Gnostic, and some do. He, he carried some of the characteristics, but not all. But he was, he was a shipbuilder, and he came to Rome and had a lot of money and gave a bunch of money to the church and became important in the church. And, but then they found out what he believed, and eventually they gave him the left foot of fellowship and, believe it or not, returned his money, which I disagreed with. I thought, hey, we're talking about money. So anyway, uh, Marcion, um, he, he 
believed in a dualistic thing. The, the, the God of the Old Testament is a God of justice, uh, and the God of the New Testament revealed by Jesus is a God of grace and mercy. So he, he was uh, uh, typical in that regard. Uh, uh, let's see what else. Um, he believed that the, uh, the Gnostics used the word uh, demiurge or something like that. I don't know if that's pronounced correctly or not. Uh, as as the as the uh, 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 half god or or a craftsman sometimes is translated as the creator of the material world, and so he saw the god of the Old Testament, the god of the, of, of the Jewish people, as the creator of the material universe or a, a man, typ- typical of the Gnostics in that sense, and then and then that. The true God had been revealed by Jesus, uh, God of grace and mercy. So, so he 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 saw Jesus in absolute conflict with uh, with the, the the God revealed in the scriptures, and they have to overlook a lot of stuff to do, get there. But so he he uh, as a matter of fact he's the uh, he's the first uh, Christian that. Uh, uh, we we're talking about the canon of the scriptures. He's he's the first one that canonized or put together a New Testament. So he uh, he took the book of Luke and edited it pretty severely, and some of the letters of Paul, and that was his New Testament. So he saw he saw in Paul's letters the foundation for the beliefs of of Gnosticism. So and that's true in both uh, John and uh, Paul. We, when we looked at the, what the uh, uh, apostles believed, uh, we covered some of the uh, statements by Paul that were used by the Gnostics. So, so he saw this parallel and, uh, between the true God revealed by Jesus and the Demiurge who had created the world, the God of the, of the uh, Old Testament. He saw that Jesus was, again, domest- a docetic Manifestation, meaning not not manif- not truly born of the flesh, not not uh, part of the world. Okay, uh, Marcion. Uh, he would have been around 140 A.D., 140, 150 A.D., something like that. A little bit after Basilides, and uh, maybe a little before the next guy that we're going to look at was. Um, Valentinus. Okay, I'm just moving swiftly along. Oh, he rejected the Old Testament and the law. Of course. Now, now, remember part part of what we're trying to get at here is how these got, how the, the, their beliefs and so on, even though even though basically rejected by Orthodox Christianity, uh, some of their concepts filtered right over into. Uh, and this is one of them that is prominent in. Uh, uh, anybody, anybody, uh, who's the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Atlanta? Charles Stanley. Charles Stanley. Uh, he has a son as the pastor of a satellite church out there somewhere. Anybody? Pardon? Anybody knows his position relative to this? He's he's preaching that. Uh, take down the Ten Commandments, the law, it doesn't have anything to do with us as Christians. Yeah. 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 So, so now, now his dad, I don't think he ever embraced anything like that, but, but so, who knows. Anyway, I, uh, you, so that that now, but Christianity in general rejects the law. Yeah, I've heard it said that you know, for us, for both Christians and really Yeah, what do we have to do with the law? Yeah, right, doesn't apply. And 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 the reality and practice uh, of Christians in general. Uh, I mean, I mean, the festivals is a good example of that. Uh, Shabbat is the most glaring example of that. Every, you know, if you notice, now the creation account, there's six days of work and one day of rest, 
the last day is the day of rest. You know, you never notice in everybody's calendar that the, day, the last day of the week is, it is what it is. There it is. And uh, so you can claim the first day and do whatever, which is fine. We always came to sort of a compromise here. We'd honor Shabbat. We'd meet on Friday night, and then uh, we'd start a new week by meeting on Sunday morning, which is convenient. Um, so. Did you know that Marcion was the one that started when I were not under the law? Was he the one that started that nonsense? No, that was Paul. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. Paul's the one that kept saying that. Now, now. I always, I always say in looking, at, in looking at Paul's letters and teaching through that, uh, uh, Paul was a very wordy writer, and I never was that fond of his style. But whatever the case, you, I always make the statement that you had to modify, moderate is a better word. You had to moderate what Paul said by what he actually did. So Paul would say we're not under the law, but then he diligently observed the law. So you have to moderate what he said by what he actually did. Uh, it's hard for some people to grasp, but uh, Paul, after being a believer for, I'm, I'm guessing, 12, 15 years, went to Jerusalem, and there was a blood sacrifice made on his behalf. How would you like that on you? If you went to a temple, let's say tomorrow they built the third temple and there were actual active sacrifices and somebody told you that you need to go up there and make a, make a, a lamb or a turtle dove, whatever they would use, a, a blood offering. Uh, would that be a conflict in you? Absolutely. Probably, probably, probably be a little problem for most of us. Paul did it. It's recorded, I think it's Acts 20. Sacrifice was made for all of them, and Paul was part of them. So, so again, you have to, in looking at Paul's writing, now, when Paul says that we're not under the law, he really was saying that we're not justified by observance of the law. That the blood of Jesus justifies us, makes us right before God, and, uh, and observance of the law does not do that. Uh, but, what, has, what Christianity has done with what he wrote is that uh, we, don't, we just ignore the law. And, and in Kentucky, I, you know, everybody likes me, but, but, you know, I'm one of those strange people that, you know, I think Sukkot is what gets them most. <laughs> when I build my little thing out there in the backyard, <laughs> sit out there. This year, what was it, it rained most of the time? It was kind of a bad time for it. In Israel, it doesn't rain that time of year, but here it does. Okay, let's, let's r rush on. I got more to do here. Uh, now, we're going to the last of the three that we're talking about, Valentinus, I guess. Uh, again, pronunciation of these guys' names, I'm not so sure of. Uh, he was, he, he was born, uh, oh, in Carthage, but he, uh, he, he was uh, educated in Alexandria in Egypt. Now, uh, date-wise, we're talking about, about 150, 160, 170 A.D., something of that range. Uh, eventually, he goes to Rome, and he becomes an elder in the Church of Rome, and very nearly became the bishop of, of the Church of Rome which would have been, by that time, would have been the mama church of everything, pretty much. Now, and remember, no central authority at this point in time. So, there, uh, you know, the church at Ephesus, at Antioch, at Alexander, at Jerusalem, all of those were operating independently, and so Rome wasn't a dominant uh, church. In 190 AD, I, I, I'm grabbing dates, I think it's correct, plus minus a year or two, 190 the bishop of Rome excommunicated the, the churches of uh, uh, Eph Ephesus and of Asia Minor, excommunicated them because they were celebrating uh, the resurrection with the Jewish Passover. Uh, 
as opposed to, uh, I, uh, now, in the first general council of the church, uh, 325, then the celebration of uh, Ishtar, Esther, Easter, whatever we call it, uh, was, was pegged as the uh, first Sunday after the first full moon following the spring equinox. I believe that's, I believe that's it. And, and so, and so uh, they, they purposely separated it from uh, being associated with uh, anything Jewish. So, okay. Uh, now, he, this guy had a very detailed uh, uh, development of uh, this supreme, primal being, unknowable, perfect, uh, from which all things e evolve. Uh, and he envisioned that there were 15 sexually complementary pairs of spiritual beings. Now, I don't know what for sure <laughs> a sexually complementary pair. I think I know what that means. So, but we're not going to check. <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're not going to get into not, not going to dig too deep in the doctrine here because we're afraid of what we might find. Anyway, that we're that were uh, emanating from uh, Bythos, whatever his name is, the primal being. Okay, and uh, the lowest of these uh, in included Sophia, we've heard of her before, and uh, Sophia interacted with her complementary pair, I guess, and brought forth the Demiurge, the creator of the material universe. And guess who that might be? The God of Israel. Okay. Uh, and Jesus was, uh, again, docetic manifestation sent to reveal the secret knowledge uh, necessary for salvation. And uh, a soul, would, uh, a human soul, contained that because, because the Demiurge had emerged from Sophia, Sophia emanated from the ultimate primal being, uh, and that because of the spark of whatever life was, divine spark they call it, was, was within the human, and through proper uh, knowledge could attain to be released from the physical body at death and uh, and, and, and attain fullness of Paloma again. Now, if, if uh, uh, as I understand it, his, his belief was that maybe most people wouldn't make the cut, wouldn't, wouldn't, didn't have enough nuts, and they recycled and tried again. So a little bit of a reincarnation type thing uh, cycled in there. So if you miss the cut the first time around, you get a shot again. Now, Next time you're going to be maybe a puppy dog or something. I don't know. I don't know what they believe. I guess it would be restricted to humans. So, so who knows what you'd be the next time around. That sounds kind of like Eastern stuff, doesn't it? Um, so, okay. Uh, what do they call that? Uh, karma or something? Or? Reincarnation. Reincarnation, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, I wanted to get to that. What, what, uh, questions about this guy? Now, he was, he was probably the most influential uh, Gnostic of that era. Now, re now remember, if you, if you read the church fathers, Irenaeus, uh, Tertullian, uh, Origen, uh, any of the so-called church fathers of this era, uh, they all wrote against heresies, against Gnosticism. Uh, so they all, they all they, so the, these this kind of lineup of the of the cre of God, uh, pretty exotic. Uh, somebody said imag somebody's imagination, and I suppose so. Uh, I don't know where they come up with the stuff at, but nevertheless, it was uniformly rejected by Orthodox Christianity. However. Much of what the Gnostics embraced filtered over into what became Orthodox Christianity. And that's just the way it is, and it's still that way. Remember then, after 325, there's an there's a, a, a established authority. 
and that uh, that established authority was, was the first time that was that was uh, successfully challenged would have been oh, what is it, 1517 Luther's <coughs> Luther's uh, 95 theses or whatever it was I, I'm again I'm just spilling off stuff uh, most of it may not be correct but it's some somewhere in that in that so so that 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 central authority was pretty solid. Of course, there was a split between the East and the West uh, around 400 AD, 395, I guess was the official date or something. And then the Eastern Orthodox uh, uh, divided and split off from the uh, uh, Roman Catholic and so on. And so, and then we, it, we're, we're a thousand years before the uh, Reformation in Europe. And, and so, and now we're 500 years from that. And so, and, and I, in one little book I wrote years ago, I, I just talked about the continuing reformation. And I believe what we're, what we're engaged in here is just a continuation of that refor reformation. So, okay. All right. Uh, questions or comments so far? We're all, everybody's happy? Had plenty of cookies? We're happy, happy. Yes, ma'am. It, yeah, I think I think it, but I think this is a product of a philosophical mind, uh, uh, and in an effort to understand and explain. I mean, you know, I I sat down in my up in Kentucky. I got a nice uh, gazebo in the backyard. It was a swing in it, and I got uh, piped in music so I can sit there in the cool of the day and and uh, and relax, and which I do. I like to do. Um, because up there it doesn't get dark till about 9:30 in the summertime, and so and so uh, uh, yeah, you know, I, 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 my mind. I'm thinking, you know, who is this God that we serve? This Jesus, you know. Uh, I've, I've got biblical foundation, but I like to think more detail, you know. So you speculate about that. So these guys were bright. They were. They were. Pardon? They were thinkers. They were thinkers. They were writers. They were bright, uh, uh, and 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 they were Greek philosophers. Uh, they had been they had been trained in all kinds of uh, Greek philosophies and so on, and uh, and remember they grew up in basically a pagan uh, society. Uh, and remember, during this period, especially uh, being Jewish, uh, being Jewish was uh, like putting a target on your back. I mean, you know, if you think about being black in the old South, perhaps I, I'm not sure if it's, that was even that bad. I, I don't know. But but I, what I'm trying to say is that they were they were. If you're Jewish, you were definitely a subculture. You, you know, the Nazis uh, saw, saw Jewish people as uh, subhuman. And, and the Romans would have too, I'm sure. I'm sorry? When, when the... Well, again, the people, the people that the people that pulled the canon of scriptures together were Orthodox Christians. They had rejected this stuff. But nevertheless, it, it came over and, and influenced it. That foundation. Now, now uh, at, the, at the same time, this was... One of the, one of the things in Rome... In the Roman Empire, I, this, I'm trying to get a reference on it. But one, one of the found, one of the, uh, one premise of Roman society was that the, the Romans would recognize uh, you as an ancient religion, if indeed you preceded, your religion preceded the foundation of Rome. 
uh, Israel would, would be, be, be in that category, the Jewish people, and of course that de predates Rome by a thousand years, or 1500 years or so. All right, so, so, uh, so there was a problem then with early Christianity in the same time as the Gnostics in the second century. There was a problem because, because Rome saw Christians. Now, the Christians and the Jews were doing this, and so the Rome says, Christians, that's a new religion. Illegal. And, and so Christian leadership had a, had a struggle, and so how did they solve their problem? They solved their problem by making the argument before the emperor that they were the, uh, the realistic or the uh, real uh, continuation of the ancient religion of Israel. And that the Jews, the, what, what, was, what, what we know as Orthodox Judaism or the continuation of the Pharisees, whatever, that they were illegitimate continuation of that tradition. And so, hence, replacement theology. And then they threw the Jews out of the Babylon. They, they did, but they held on to the scripture because that was their claim for authenticity before Rome. So they couldn't get rid of the Hebrew scriptures. They were, they were claiming that that was foundation to who they were. All right. Somebody give me a good Christian song about heaven. I'll fly away. Let me see if I can find I'll fly away. <laughs> when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll... That's good. Something like that? Is that it? Let me just do one at a time. <laughs> oh, gosh. They got a... They got a... Str oh, now, I'm going to find the right index here. Certainly. I don't believe that they didn't have I'll Fly Away in here. This is, a, this is the Baptist hymnal. We'll look at that. It's got it. Well, we must have another name for it because... All right, we'll try that one. When we... I don't see it either. Hey, come on. When we all get to heaven. How about when the row is called up yonder? I, f I found that. All right. All right. Here's when the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Uh, James Black, 1893. Oh, that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of the resurrection share when his chosen one shall gather to their home beyond the skies. And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let the talk of all the wondrous loving care. Let us talk of all his wondrous loving care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Now, now, now we've all sung that song sometimes. Uh, now, what, 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 what am I trying to say? Do you, do, you, do you hear Gnosticism in that song? You see where Gnosticism is there? Uh, I'm not trying to belittle the song or, or people that sing the song, but, but much of theology is conveyed to people by way of song, and it's very disarming. You don't even realize what's happening. Uh, 
for years here, uh, uh, Joe Reen would go to the bookstore and buy a little uh, course books and or go to Walmart and get at a time there were tapes and then there was CDs and whatever and listen to them and about 95% of the stuff she'd toss out and because she would listen she would listen to the music if the music now th this is something I, I feel is really important if the music was what nursing to the soul uh, nourishing to the soul is that would that be uh, uplifting uh, focus focus you in a godly f focus if the if the music did that she kept it she'd bring it to Larry <laughs> and then Larry would go through it and and look at it from a theological standpoint is change the pronouns or whatever and sometimes reword if necessary and and bring it biblically to correct and then we'd adopt it that's how we adopt songs for years and 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 believe me believe me that that was an important ministry uh, because because then our our worship praise and song matched scripturally what we were doing all right anybody else got another good song Well, I, that may be a, that may be okay. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul when that my Savior made me whole. Sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came. I'm okay with that so far. I like that one. We don't have to change that one. I don't think. See. All right, we'll try them. I, th I think it's in here. Let's see what that says. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's in it. 475. Please turn to page 475. First, second, and last. <laughs> You've all done that, haven't you? <laughs> I heard an old, low story how a Savior come from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning, and I repented of my sin and won the victory. Okay, so far. I heard about his healing of his cleansing power, revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. I heard about a mansion, now here we are, I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory, and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story, and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Now, some sense, new creation, that, that you know, streets, that's legitimate, but it, he's talking about happy place where dead people go. So, so, all right. All right, we've, we've done our exercise. Uh, uh, I did that. So if you, if you hear songs, you, you, need, you need to weigh them uh, a bit to make sure that they are uplifting. Biblically sound and uh, now uh, there's a lot of contemporary Christian music can be biblically sound and not not nourishing to the soul. If it goes like that, what does that do to you? I don't know that it really does that, but but I mean you you get you, 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 there's no. There's no flow, there's no flow, continuity that's uplifting. But it's, if it's jerky, what does it do for you? What do you, what do you call that? Syncopation? Is that what you call that? Syncopated. Syncopated. Looks like you got a twitch or something. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, I've never been to a rock concert, but but my my sons have, and they say, hey, rock concerts are a spiritual experience. Well, I don't mean godly. I don't mean necessarily godly, but but they but they stir the they stir you spiritually. That's what they're all about. So they use lights, smoke, and lights, and, and 110 dB, and whatever, you know, uh, 100, what's, what's painful, 120, 110, 120, what, what, we used to, on a flight deck of a carrier right behind a, a jet engine winding up, you'd get about 110, 120 dB, uh, which is on the, right on the pain threshold. Uh, so, so uh, I think rock concerts are right on the edge of pain threshold. I think that's where they aim at. Uh, the word is too. <laughs> they help you over the threshold. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I don't doubt that. I, uh, but to tell you the truth, most of the words, most of the stuff I'm trying to listen to, some of it, I, I don't have any idea what they're saying. Well, that's why they. All right, next week we'll do the last chapter. How, how about, we're, we're reading right through this. I didn't turn it off.